Welcome to Speechless. We're glad to have you here this Thursday night. And another very interesting show uh, going on because so much is happening. Of course, the legislature is in session and they're taking away uh, your public input, making it a lot harder for the public to give input regarding rules and regulations um, that the administration executive branch puts into place based on laws uh, that have been written by the legislature. Uh, you know, and the whole goal of having a republic and a democracy is so that people have this free speech and can have their opinions expressed and heard. But the DFL is setting such high uh, hurdles to overcome that it will just make it really difficult to overcome these hurdles to be able to be heard in an in a administrative hearing on new rules or regulations that are going to be put in place, and it's, it's pretty bad. But uh, so that's going on in the legislature, uh, baby DNA taking away your right to have control over your own DNA, and who profits off of that has, uh, is being taken away from you, as I understand it. The main show tonight is going to be about a Supreme Court order that came out just uh, Wednesday, yesterday. I've discussed this on the show for a long time, and that is uh, this 50-year restraining order for restraining order order for protection that uh, has been put into law. And uh, the Minnesota Supreme Court, after 16 months, or basically over 16 and a half months, finally came out with a decision on this and saying that the 50-year restraining order is constitutional and as applied to uh, James Bergstrom did not violate any of his constitutional rights. Uh, so, I mean, it's amazing to me that this happened. I'm sure there's going to be appeal on, uh, an appeal to the U.S. Supreme Court, uh, but there are a lot of issues discussed here. It's a complicated case but you need to know it and we're going to discuss part of it today because I don't think we'll get through it all and then uh, fairly soon we'll get a number of uh, uh, lawyers in here to hash out what actually took place in this case. Uh, so we'll find it interesting. Uh, so if you have been abused and you got two or more OFPs against somebody and you need to listen, if you're being accused of being abusive and you have some order for protections, OFPs against you, you need to watch. If you have any or you are being accused, you need to watch this show because you're going to get some insight as to what you need to do uh, in, in both situations and what's going to take place. Unfortunately, our government, in making orders for protection so easy, uh, they're going to have a whole lot more expenses because people are going to have to fight these order for protections tooth and nail, and, um, especially if they didn't happen. Uh, if they did happen, you know, th this is a good thing. Uh, we, we need to stop abuse. We need to have it stopped, and we need to protect people. But the domestic violence industry has become abusive itself in the way they conduct themselves, and this is a prime example of it. Uh, another case we're going to discuss just briefly before uh, uh, the Bergstrom case and the 50-year uh, order for protections uh, is the uh, Secretary of State, Mark Ritchie. We just had Dan Severson on last week dealing with uh, his run for Secretary of State and the issues with voter uh, fraud and going on in Minnesota. Well, a district court judge just last Tuesday issued an order telling Mark Ritchie that he must take down the online registration website and, and that he violated the law, and it was a serious violation uh, that he did. So we're going to discuss that, and I went to the press conference that took place uh, shortly after the order was issued. Now, so I don't have film of that. I do have one picture 
that I had to get from somebody else, but uh, um, that was fascinating in of itself. But before I get into that, I don't, um, just some updates on some issues that we've talked about in the past. On this Peltier case in Massachusetts, uh, the Department of Children and Families, the, the, the chief of this department, her name was Olga Roche, uh, she has resigned. In this Peltier case, you're dealing with a, a family who had a sick daughter, had sought medical attention, was under a care of a doctor, uh, and I believe even a couple of doctors and a hospital. And her daughter got sick and uh, with the flu or some type of symptoms. And so they went to the closest hospital. And while at that hospital, the doctor in residence said, no, something else is going on here. We're taking your child from you as the net effect of that. And we're changing the medication. We're changing the diagnosis without consulting the other doctors. And this is really part of a massive change that is going on in our health care system, not only with Obamacare, but prior to it, where you have what's called hospitalists. And these hospitalists, uh, your own doctor can't go into that hospital. They have to have special, super, top secret um, permission uh, um, to get in to that hospital. That's a slight exaggeration, but I saw this happen to my dad. I, I, I've heard of other people. I've seen it happen to other people. And these doctors know nothing about you. They haven't handled your case while your current doctor who has can't get in there, can't consult with these other doctors as to what's going on. And when my dad was passing away and they're trying to figure out what medications to give him, he had the doc every single nurse, every single doctor that came and they rotate them, they every single one of them we had to explain over and over and over again, no, he has this. This is what's going on. This is what's being treated. And if he had his regular doctor, none of that would have happened. And so it's very, very frustrating. And so these guys are making diagnosis off things that they don't know and giving him medication off of things that they never knew. Well, this is the same thing, type of thing with this uh, uh, Peltier uh, with their, their daughter. And so the doctors and then the Massachusetts Department of Children and Families out of the best interest of the child standard, they took custody of the daughter and now the daughter is wasting away and not doing well. Well, something else has happened is three other children under this, uh, the, the chief of the Department of Children and Families in Massachusetts have died. And so this head person, Olga Roche, I think, uh, has now resigned. <laughs> and well, she should, should, but, and a judge has said, no, Peltiers, you lose custody. Um, the, the hospital, the state has custody, and we're going to do, and folks, I mean, we're going to do what we want with your daughter, uh, and who, you know, too bad. Um, this, I mean, this is a problem. So parental rights in that case is being eroded, and uh, we're seeing that happening in the legislature here in Minnesota uh, with your baby DNA. Uh, you have to get, uh, uh, I mean, the hospital is going to collect it. You have to go and object to them collecting, but you want to do these DNA tests. You, you absolutely want to do them, but go to a private doctor so that you have it and the state doesn't have it. You don't want the state to have your DNA because they are going to study it. It will be able to be tracked back to you and they will sell what they learn on it and you won't get any money for it. It's uniquely you and you're out of the picture. This, this is, is bad news. So, you know, the, the legislature said, oh yes, uh, look what's happened when people don't take this test. They've been confused and told not to take the test. Well, no, that's what the legislature has done uh, by opposing your privacy rights. They uh, misconstrued what you need to do 
as, as a parent. So take the test, but do it through a private doctor. You know, don't have the hospital, don't, don't have um, the government, don't give the government permission to collect data off of you. Uh, you you'll, you'll just pay for it later. If they need your DNA for some critical emergency, um, you can give it to them. But until then, don't give it to them. So it's, uh, it's a bad deal. I mean, Minnesota, I mean, parental rights have been under huge attack in Minnesota big time this year. Uh, okay, uh, some other updates. Hey, here's a question you need to ask the people running for state rep or for U.S. rep and for um, U.S. Senate. Ask them if they're going to sign on to the constitutional amendment that will preserve parental rights, that will make parental rights a fundamental right so you can raise your children in the education upbringing of your choice, because that's not there now. And even though the U U.S. Supreme Court has ruled that it's a high right, parents have high rights, uh, there are so many ways to erode those rights and go around you, supposedly your due process rights. And, Minnesota Supreme Court just last uh, Wednesday, uh, yesterday, just basically did the same thing in this Rue v. Bergstrom case. Um, that's Rue versus Bergstrom, and it's just it's just bad news, um, and and we'll get into that later. But uh, another thing, so that's a good question to ask them and ask them whether they will support that constitutional amendment. It's just a, a fundamental thing that happened in our country for years and years and years and years. Part of our history, uh, the foundation of our country was families, uh, family rights, uh, the right to raise your kids in your own religion, and that is just going away and it's being hit hard uh, in Minnesota and across the nation and we need to act now to preserve those. And part of the whole gay lesbian lobby part of their process and you got the surrogacy bill going through the minnesota house and senate right now so that you can pay uh, uh, other women to carry your baby is so that gay and lesbians have the freedom have the can go and get families they can't get them naturally it's imp it's impossible <laughs> natural law says uh, you got to have a man and a woman and uh, so, I mean, this has been going on since the beginning of time. And now what they're trying to do is destroy the family and establish these abnormal families, families without a father and mother or a mother, you know, just two fathers, two mothers, or, you know, five. And, and so since you can't have a, a family with two moms, you can't have children with two moms unless a third party comes in there, and you can't have children with two guys. I know some of this is hard to figure out, you know, but it just it's just the way it is. Some some time you'll figure it out that two guys can't have a baby and two women can't have a baby uh, by themselves. Uh, they can't produce one, um, so they have to get it some other way. And so all these laws are designed to destroy the the natural family and then uh, they have to get the the gay lesbian transgender community has to get their kids some other way so that's why these laws are being changed in Minnesota uh, and also why we need the parental rights act uh, constitutional amendment okay uh, but sometimes there is good news and Last Monday, the Wall Street Journal announced the demise of InBloom software firm as a result of parental opposition to National Student Database. Now, this InBloom software system, that was funded by Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And, of course, Bill and, Bill and Melinda Gates was also pushing Common Core curriculum, okay, which is out there teaching... Uh, sodomy is okay. It's teaching sexual confusion so you don't know who you are. We got kids now, kids taking 
uh, medication, so girls are growing beards. Uh, it's just a, it's just a tragedy. I mean, these are teenagers growing beards. It's a tragedy that this is this has taken place, because, I mean, you can just look and see what you are, <laughs> you know. But the curriculum is designed to create the the sexual confusion as to what you are uh, biologically, and then also uh, it's. It's basically, you know, and it just confuses, it doesn't confuse me. I know why it's happening, but there's all this anti-trafficking going on, and yet we're teaching our kids in, in uh, high school and junior high to participate in uh, sexual deviancy, uh, deviancy uh, through sodomy and other sexual practices that aren't natural. And as you've seen on uh, my show and with Representative Glenn Grunhagen, our body is made for certain things. Our, our mouth is made to collect food and to digest and to get things into our, our bloodstream as, as well as our colons, okay? And, and so a woman's body is made to collect things from men in order to have a baby. And those two pathways they don't they don't work and if you're confusing them you end up hurting yourself significantly the health risk is significant yet we're going to teach our kids that this behavior is okay and it it's going to hurt us but part of this common core curriculum uh, is a data Base collection system, a national database system. And if you see that ad on TV, have you seen that where these teachers come out and say we're for Common Core and it isn't a federal program at all? Uh, and so we give the people speaking against Common Core an F. These people are so misleading. They are correct. It is not. And a federal program, the Common Core curriculum. They're absolutely 100% is not a federal curriculum. So how can I give them an F rating? Is because the other side has not said, the, the side that's against Common Core, they have not said it's a federal curriculum. States are implementing it. Some schools are implementing it. Uh, 10 school districts in Minnesota or 12 school districts uh, by my last count, here's the deal. It is being promoted by the Gates and Soros. That's who's promoting it. And you get politicians like Jeb Bush uh, who's promoting Common Core, but it's being funded outside the government. Okay, But it is a national organization rather than a local group. So the advertisement is misleading, not telling the truth. It's trying to deceive you. And so therefore, I give them an F in their ad. And, and you know, and I was going to bring it in, but we'll play that ad uh, hopefully next week, and I'll show you why it's an F, because it is a national program. It's being promoted by a few people with a lot of money, paying out a lot of money to get it pushed. Uh, and, and not a federal program. They're trying to make it a federal program, but um, you know we'll see what happens with it. But in part of that program, uh, com with Common Core, they had this in Bloom software, which is a na national database collection system on your student, or your child. And so evidently, because of the pressure that was put in um, by people, mostly homeschoolers, mm -hmm. Um, or allies of homeschoolers, uh, the in Bloom software system has, uh, they're not going to do it. So, um, a lot of people objected to it. You should too. And we just can't, you got to understand, in my opinion, Minnesota in the, this year has turned itself into the Third Reich. We are doing the same things with data collection, research on people without their permission. Remember, the Nazis did it 
Um, they, they just arrested you, pulled your teeth, dunked you in tanks, tortured you, did all kinds of things. Well, we're going to do it. Um, basically, you have to opt out of it, which is essentially without your permission. Um, and they're going to do all these type of tests DNA-wise, and they're going to own it, and they're going to control it, and they're going to still be able to identify who you are, and they may be able to do something against you with it. So anyway, this is a victory uh, against Common Core that this uh, software system has been canceled, but guess what? It's still there. And as all these curriculum, nas uh, national curriculums have come out, whether it's Race to the Top, Common Core, they, they just keep changing the name year after year after year. Uh, it is important that these things get stopped and this one got stopped. Uh, so today supposedly the House was going to vote on the baby DNA uh, genetic privacy repeal and I'm pretty sure it will, yeah it did, and the Senate uh, uh, passed it today, um, pretty, pretty much a party line vote. What it does is this bill is not about newborn screening. It's about what happens after newborn screening is done. It's about who has primary control over every newborn's DNA. Today, today parents have the control over your baby's DNA. The bill shifts control to state government and the Minnesota Department of Health, which will store and use it without consent. No consent required. Okay, repeals parent consent. The bill repeals today's informed written parental consent requirements for government storage use, analysis, and sharing of baby DNA taken at birth for the state government's newborn screening program. Government claims a right to every newborn citizen's DNA at birth. This is a repeal of genetic privacy rights. This should scare you. You know, if you're against the NSA collecting data on you, here in Minnesota, we're collecting the biggest NSA uh, DNA <laughs> database uh, that can ever happen, and you have no say, uh, is my understanding. Burden on parents. The bill replaces today's parent consent requirement with parent dissent opt-out options. Government has first dibs to baby DNA taken at birth unless parents know unless a par unless unless parents know it's happening and studies show they don't know and you know I never knew most parents have no clue that it's happening you just had your baby they come in you're in, you've just gotten through with labor and they tell you sign these forms you need to do it in order you know for your the health of your baby don't give you full disclosure of what's going on, and you sign the forms, and you've just given away your baby's DNA to the government. Uh, they don't know they can object. They don't know they can take action to object through filing a government form. This places an undue burden on par parents and violates parents' rights and genetic privacy rights. So we're going to go back to court, and this has all gone through court again as a been through court and the U.S. Minnesota Supreme Court ordered all these baby DNS tests to be destroyed uh, because it violated, um, con I believe it was because of constitutional violations. Okay, genetic research permitted. The bill allows baby DNA to be dissected, analyzed, and used for newborn screening studies and test development without parents' consent. This is genetic research because newborn screening is considered the nation's largest population-wise genetic testing program. A University of Michigan study found almost 75% of parents opposed to research op opposed research without parents' consents. And finally, allows government sequencing of child. Nothing prohibits the government or their contractors from fully sequencing the entire genome of a child as part of newborn screening studies and test developments. The complete genetic blueprint of the child would be detailed and placed in a government file. Already the federal government has provided four institutions, 25 million to develop genomic sequencing program for a newborn screening. Serious stuff there. Uh, 
very serious. Okay, uh, well, that took longer than I expected, uh, but we're, we're moving on. Now, here's, here's the new um, thing uh, with Mark Ritchie, Secretary of State. And I went to the press conference uh, here, and what Mark Ritchie established was online registration system. And he had no permission by the legislature to do it. He thought he did. Yeah, right. You know, that's what he said. Um, but a district court judge said he violated the law. Uh, and what was interesting in this process, and this happens, you go into a courtroom and a judge will tell you, as they told Minnesota Voters Alliance and Minnesota Majority and the four uh, representatives uh, that were in the lawsuit, actually, let's uh, bring up the picture of the people involved in the lawsuit. That would be number, uh, number eight in the control room. Uh, bring him <laughs> graphic number eight there. Um, here's the people in the lawsuit. Okay, on the left is Dan McGrath. He's with Minnesota Majority. Uh, next to him is Representative Ernie Leidiger. And I believe from Scott County area, Carver County area. Uh, he was one of the plaintiffs in the lawsuit against uh, Mark Ritchie, Secretary of State. In the middle is Andy Selick with Minnesota Voters Alliance. And uh, next to him, to the right of him, is Representative Steve Dershkowski. And then on the far right is Eric Cardle, the attorney. And he shows up in a lot of these cases. He's a fantastic attorney. Um, and... So two other representatives, Mary Franson and Jim Newberger. Mary was there but left right away before I can get her in the picture. But these are the people in the lawsuit suing the Minnesota, uh, uh, Minnesota Secretary of State. Um, the judge ordered that the Secretary of State, Mark Rich Ritchie, uh, a Democrat, exceeded his authority and must shut down the online voter registration website he launched September 26. Now the judge at the beginning of the hearing tells Minnesota Voters Alliance, tells the uh, uh, petitioners in this case, can you just drop it? Can you do anything to settle this out of here? Can you just make it go away? And this happens a lot. These judges go in there, and that's intimidation in my book. You know, that's pushing one side to say, hey, just leave it alone. They shouldn't be doing that. Um, and you know what? They said, no, we're going to pursue this. This is wrong. But you have a judge there trying to get them not to do it. And that judge then, after you heard the case, said, I'm going to make sure this goes 90 days out. I'm going to wait till the 90th day before I make my decision, which is what he was trying to do and what we find that happens in these cases. Judges go and they try to give the legislature time to fix the problem. And in this case, the legislature didn't fix the problem. And so the judge had to wait 90 days and he actually rolled in Minnesota Voters Alliance uh, favor, which and the Minnesota majority, and which makes, uh, you know, it's just interesting that that's the type of ball game that's getting played there. Um, but obviously this judge felt he had no other choice but to rule against Secretary of State, because that's a very, very difficult thing to do politically for a judge. So uh, Secretary Mark Ritchie's registration website is now shut down and Internet voter registration is stopped in Minnesota. But if you already signed up, the judge said you're good to go. Uh, but there is more to the story because our lawsuit was not about stopping online voter registration itself. Our legal action was brought for the purpose of stopping liberals from using the reins of elective office to install their own political machinery without legislative authorization. This victory will not stop online, online registration itself because both houses of the Minnesota legislature, Republican and Democrats alike, and the governor are all for it. So it's already passed the House and the Senate, 
we're waiting for the governor's seat. Uh, actually, there's a conference committee that's been called. So in the next uh, day or so, that conference committee, because the bills were different, um, that conference committee in the House and the Senate will work out the difference. We'll go back to each of the houses, the Senate and the House, and then they'll pass it, and then Governor Dayton will sign it. But what this provided was much needed security protection that Mark Ritchie did not put in. And my understanding is at least three uh, additional security, internet security options. And we know how trouble corporations who have money are having protecting people's rights, uh, <clears throat> even Target, uh, or people keeping that data out. How is the government going to do this? And so they, they did a lot of research and that great bipartisan support in both the House, uh, at least when the House bill passed it. So, and I, and I believe in the Senate side too, we had a lot of support um, on both sides. So it's not that people don't want it, it's how you do it and who has the authority to do it. Uh, but at the press conference, and then I wish I had it filmed, I'm sorry it didn't work out, but uh, Steve Draskowski, Representative Draskowski, says the people of Minnesota have won. And this, what's interesting about this, this is a, a petition for and issuing a writ of core warranto. That means issuing, saying, uh, you can't do this, uh, Secretary of State. It's stopping an action. And they came in there based on that the f aspect that they were taxpayers. And that at least the Minnesota Voters Alliance and Minnesota Majority, we're taxpayers. We pay taxes. This was not authorized to do, or you're spending money that you're not authorized to spend. The representatives came in and said, hey, this is our job, not the Secretary of State's job. We make the laws, not the Secretary of State's job. Secretary's jo job is to enforce the law and to uh, apply the law under its jurisdiction that the legislature has given the Secretary of State. And to be able to come in as taxpayers in this quo warranto, writ of quo warranto, is a huge win. And um, uh, being able to come in, if you think about Eric Cardle, um, if you think about all the things you have vetted, here is something that the Secretary of State uh, oh, Ernie Leidiger said this, that the Secretary of State builds on his own without vetting. That, that was a key statement he made. No vetting, why are you doing this? Uh, Minnesota is better off because the bill that went and, and is, seems to be passing has been vetted. Okay, that doesn't mean there won't be problems with it. Uh, Dan McGrath, Mark Ritchie exceeded his authority. Victory for the rule of law sets presidents for future Secretary of States, and it does. It says, sends a big message. Um, Andy Selick, unconstitutional. Uh, it was an unconstitutional power grab. Citizens, hold, citizens were able to hold the government accountable, and we established a process. These people, through this lawsuit, established a process that said, yeah, this is a legitimate way to do this. These core warrantos are seldom done. Uh, but now that it is established, and of course, could there be an appeal? Yes, there could be, uh, but I, I, I doubt this. But the process is established, so taxpayers now have some standing because in other situations, it's been ruled that taxpayers don't have standing on tax issues. Um, Eric Card Cardell said, uh, petition for core warranto, by what authority do you act? And that's that's what it means. And um, Secretary of State came in and the judge said, you have no authority, can't do that. Um, and what should happen, any money that has been spent should be given back. And But w one thing that happens in the legislature that you need to know is that when a... Um, Department spends more money than they have allocated to them. 
either during that session or the upcoming session, the legislature usually goes and says, hey, um, you know, we're going to allocate money for that excessive spending there. We'll make it good. We basically do a retroactive law. Um, but in the legislature right now, there is no bill for this retroactive spending. And if the legislature doesn't pass a bill for this retroactive spending, uh, Mark Ritchie will be in a hurting situation. It's actually a crime to convert private funds for um, retroactive spending. And so, you know, how is he going to come up with this money? What's going to happen here? Uh, we don't know. And there may be another lawsuit on that, or Mark Ritchie may be charged with a crime uh, later on. That is not what this group of people, Minnesota Voters Alliance, Minnesota Majority, or the representatives had in mind, but it may get there. Um, but what they can do now is they can do a data practice request to find out what was spent, how it was spent, and, um, and if the court uh, has a hearing and he's violated the law, uh, then he'd be guilty of a crime because it is a crime to spend money you don't have authorization to, authorization to spend as part of the executive branch. And it was interesting, uh, Eric Cardle, the attorney on this case, kind of set up the program by uh, the part of the press conference by saying, you know, I don't know what kind of legacy Secretary of State Mark Ritchie is setting here, but he's now have been found twice to violate the law. This, I don't remember what the first one was, but this is the second one. And so then one of the um, reporters in the room asked, well, what do you think his legacy is going to be? <laughs> and Eric Carl said, <clears throat> well, in the populist groups that i around and associated with, uh, they have a term that they call this as a, being a serial violator of the law. <laughs> In other words, the guy's got problems. So what I would, um, um, and what wasn't asked, and I wish I would have remembered, you know, another remedy for Secretary of State Mark Ritchie is that he gets impeached. He's violated the law twice now that district courts have found out about. The first one hasn't been appealed, I don't believe. And now this one. So that sounds like impeachment to me. Uh, that's a bad deal. And if you don't think that this online registration needs security, Florida had over a thousand online absentee requests um, that were illegitimate. And the only reason Florida found these online absentee requests is because they, they just had this automatic registration system signing people up. Uh, you know, it was a computer program. The problem was it ran too fast. And all of a sudden they noticed all these registrations coming and uh, they figured out some, uh, somebody had hacked the system. If it would have ran it slower, they wouldn't have found out. And so um, because now we're going through the legislative process, uh, we're building in ways to prevent that from happening. Uh, so <laughs> it's uh, quite quite a deal. All right, well, the main stuff here. Hey, and folks, call in if you have a comment or question on any of this, 651-747-3838, uh, and give me your opinion. Uh, that'd be great. You can watch past shows on YouTube.com, Speechless MN, Speechless Minnesota. Also, if you want to email me with questions or comments, Go to speechlessmn at gmail.com. Uh, all right, let's get to this 50-year re restraining order. you got to realize, uh, we got a call coming in, so maybe I'll wait just a second before uh, we get to this 50-year restraining order. But you got to realize this is difficult for any parent to go through. So we got a call. So, um, caller, do you have a comment or question? Thanks for an outstanding show. The question I have is you initially said you were to talk about the Jim 
Bergstrom restraining order in the U.S. Uh, Minnesota Supreme Court, and that came down this week, I guess. Yes. And I looked at it, and it said that Kim Bergstrom, James Bergstrom, did not have an attorney, but I, on an earlier show, I thought you said that Joe Clark wrote the written argument and argued in front of the Minnesota Supreme Court, and yet the Minnesota Supreme Court said he was pro se. Uh, without an attorney. So what's going on there? I mean, we understand that the Minnesota Supreme Court is simply a political body headed by politicians, and uh, it continued in their uh, their life is intended to these politicians. They're running their, their career and their life at the Minnesota Supreme Court as they choose which uh, issues they're going to take. But in the Jim Maxstrom bill, have they started to miss the facts? You're kind of breaking up a little bit there. Uh, what was that last sentence? Uh, the Minnesota Supreme Court misrepresenting the real record. I mean, oh. they can't even get the facts right of who the attorney is. Yeah. <laughs> you wonder what the more ambiguous stuff, what's going on. Right, right. Yeah, I mean, and, and they did address it in the order, although... Oh. Oh, on the front here, it says uh, James Allen Bergstrom, appellant, uh, he was pro se. He was pro se in this. He was not pro se one bit in this case. Not one bit. But the Minnesota Supreme Court created its own problem. And they, this is how they resolved it. Because remember, James Bergstrom's case was heard on December 11th, 2012. Okay? And it was heard by Jill Clark, uh, who was my attorney, and also James Bergstrom's. But then uh, a little later in December, it came back that Jill lost her license as of December 7th. So she lost it as December 7th, but was arguing before the Supreme Court on December 11th. So why didn't they put down uh, Bergstrom was represented by Jill Clark? Because he was. He was representative by Jill Clark. So here's what they came with. But now she lost her license on December 7th. So what do they do? Here's what they write. Until submission of this case, Bergstrom was represented by counsel approximately two months after or oral argument. However, we temporarily suspended Bergstrom's attorney. We later placed the attorney on inactive status. Substitute counsel has not appeared on Bergstrom's behalf. Accordingly, even though counsel represented Bergstrom on the briefs and at oral argument, we designated Bergstrom as appearing pro se in this opinion. You know, I mean, they just totally rip off Jill Clark. Her name should have still been on it. Um, but they created a problem, and they don't address it here. They don't say what really happened. They don't say that, oh yeah, she represented, I mean, she said, they didn't say who, but they said she was, uh, she was there. She did all the work. All that we were just waiting for is the decision. But since she lost her license after the hearing and they retroacted the license being lost to before the hearing, they got to play this little game. And, oh, you know, just let's whistle Dixie and just, you know, forget it ever happened. <laughs> so that is a, thanks, caller, uh, that is just a fascinating part of this whole drama that's going on here. Okay, James Bergstrom had a 50-year order, 50-year order for protection issued against him. And he filed on a number of issues, and we're not going to get to them all, and I'm kind of glad because it's complicated and i got to go through some more stuff, but it's not that complicated. It just needs to be presented better uh, than I have it presented and prepared for today. But I'm going to cover a couple of issues, but I'm going to cover what the issues were. There's uh, at least 10 of, 10 of them. But James Backstrom won, not on the 50-year order for protection, but on the aspect that this order for protection was put against him and his kids for 50 years, and he could not then see his kids, yet he has no allegation of abuse against his kids. The court, in their orders, admitted uh, 
um, the Chief Justice uh, uh, Lori Gilday says, well, it's implied, you know, obviously it's implied because domestic abuse happened, it must be against the kids. Uh, and they just confuse so many of the issues that went on in this case. It, it's just baffling to me. Um, and but we'll we'll get into that. Here here was the ten things that James Back, James Back, uh, Bergstrom was appealing uh, to extend an order for protection under Minnesota Statute 518B.01, Subdivision 6A. There is no requirement that district court makes finding of domestic abuse. Do you understand that? <clears throat> There's no requirement that if you're going to extend a domestic abuse order or an order for protection, you have to have you don't have to have findings of domestic abuse. Or or that district court make finding of do domestic abuse. And we'll, we're going to have to get into the, the actual statute on a l later show and, and go into more detail and just kind of do the whole show on that rather than some of these updates. The test, art second one, the test articulated in Madison versus Woman, Women's Health Center uh, is the appropriate standard to evaluate the constitutionality of a content neutral induction injunction that burdens speech. Three, the statutory provision authorizing a district court to extend an order for protection for up to 50 years does not facially violate the First Amendment to the United States Constitution or Article 1, Section 3 of the Minnesota Constitution. They're just saying this doesn't violate free speech rights. Um, a lot of issues. The order for protection in incidental restrictions on the appellant's speech to his ex-wife the victim of domestic abuse are permissible under the First Amendment to the United States Constitution, Article 1, Section 3. Uh, in order to, an order for protection that restricts the appellant's contact with his minor children applies only until uh, the children reach 18 years of age, which this, this was fascinating um, because the order was for 50 years, so he won on this that once the children reach age 18, the order for protection automatically goes off. But you got to ask yourself the question, if it was bad enough to put an order for protection out for 50 years, why do they stop it at eight, age 18? Why do they say, okay, and they're telling the district court judge, uh, you have to order this. On the kids, the order for protection goes off after age 18. Why? Because they can make their own decision at that point in time? It still doesn't make sense whether they can make their own decision or not. Um, of course, the kids can go to court and, and ask for an order for protection, uh, but they, they don't give any reason as to why it should go off. So it, it just it seems bizarre that if, it, if the 50 years is deserved in one case, why does it stop at age 18 for the kids? Of course, we're going to have to lay a foundation of what the law actually says. Um, the record, the sixth area, the record and the district court's finding are insufficient to determine whether the restrictions in the order for protection that limit the appellant's contact with his, children, with his minor children are consistent with the First Amendment to the United States Constitution. Um, this was another win because there's been no allegation of abuse to the kids or that the kids have seen abuse or have been harmed in any way emotionally either uh, by James Backstrom. And there have been no findings on this. So here what the court did is they went and said, okay, James, you can go back to this judge that's crucifying you and making things up and uh, throwing things into an order that um, has no justification whatsoever um, and you got to go back to that judge, and that judge has to make some findings. There's, there's got to be evidence to determine whether the restrictions um, that were ordered actually apply and fit the law. Um, so now the judge has to do this, and so James has to go back there. I mean, for 
this is a win. This is a huge win. And this opens the door so that James Baxter can see his kids. And you got to understand that even with that win, this is a terribly, terribly difficult and emotional thing to go through because you still got to go before the same judge. And that judge is out to get you. And I've seen that judge in two different cases. And uh, I, she's, wow, Ugh, I, I can't tell you what I think about her. Um, she's not, she's got an agenda uh, going on. And I, I don't, I personally don't believe, I, I personally believe she's a man hater. Um, but she knows the fraud and the false allegations of abuse that are going on in this case, and she doesn't care. Uh, anyway, seven, the pro that's in my opinion. The process afforded to the appellant, number seven here, the process afforded to the appellant when the district court granted an extension of the order for protection for up to 50 years was sufficient to satisfy his appellant right to do procedural due process. And I'm going to have to lay a foundation for that. And to determine whether a sanction is civilly remedy or criminal penalty for purpose of Article 1, Section 10 of the United States Constitution. That's ex post facto law, both of which prohibit ex post facto laws we adopt analysis used by the Supreme Court of the United States. In other words, what was going on in Bergstrom's case is in 2012 this new law was passed uh, on the 50-year order for protection was put in place. But back in 2002, 2007, 2008, that law wasn't in place. And so that affects how you make your decision on what you plead for an order for protection. So the 2002 order for protection, James Backstrom was forced by his wife to say, I will work on the marriage and I will get rid of my false allegations against you uh, if you plead if you plead no contest to this order for protection or if you plead guilty, then I will work on the marriage. And so she worked on the marriage for five years until she came up with another one and then started having uh, relationships with uh, other women. And <clears throat> um, uh, my understanding, and therefore decided, hey, well, it was easy enough on the first one, let's do it again. And so he thinks he's going to get some uh, protection there uh, and keep the marriage relationship going while she plays her game. And then she, look, you don't want to see me? Fine. Okay, order of protection, big deal. But then you start, and the kids weren't brought into the picture, but then the kids got brought into the picture, and this law in 2012 looks back to 2002 and 2007, 2008, and all of a sudden you've... You were thinking one thing, and now you got to do another. And this is important. This is why you have to defend hard against false allegations of abuse, because you will get these 50-year restraining orders on you, and you will see what's going to happen, uh, and you will lose your kids, and this type of game will get played. And it's going up the court, back to district court, up the court, back up and down. And believe me, this Judge Hennon, in Washington County is not going to play nice or not going to play fair. And there is a lawsuit going on. Oh, there's so many webs. I, you know, I'm going to have to get my uh, chart out and draw you a diagram of all the webs because there's a federal lawsuit because one of these order for protections that was being sought was fake. And the Oakdale police knew it was fake. And the Washington County police uh, knew it was fake. But they ordered uh, James Bergstrom in a violation of, a, of an OFP because Rue, his ex-wife, showed up at his church, his place of work, where he lived, and said, oh, he's here, he's violating his OFP. But she didn't go to that church. She had no business with the work, and she didn't live there. So she shows up and says, I go to this church. And the pastor tells the police, no, she doesn't. I've never seen her before, and she's never been here before. And so the Oakdale police go, oh, wow, um, yeah, obviously this is fake. So we're not going to do anything about it, okay? And if James 
wanted to, Bergstrom wanted to do something, he can file his, uh, his, his own complaint for a false report. Well, in the process, uh, Rue, his ex-wife, goes to the Woodbury police where she has a friend, and they work this scheme up with a lot of people, and he goes to jail for 53 days or thereabouts and sits there until the charges are finally dropped. And so there's a big federal lawsuit going on now in Washington County about, about this case. Um, so, but in that case, he still had Joe Clark as his attorney, and she was being disabled. She was sick. She was having seizures, and timelines were uh, going bad and on both parts. And the federal district court said, we're not going to hear this case. You've had your chance. We're throwing it out with prejudice. It was appealed. The Eighth Circuit Court of Appeals, uh, three-panel uh, judge, uh, heard the case and they reopened it and now the lawsuit's back on and Woodbury is in a whole lot of hot water. All right, well, we're going to have to do another show on this. Remember, if you don't stand up for other people's liberties, who's going to stand up for yours? And good men don't do nothing. God bless. Have a great week. Sets on fire